Então, start na porra. Good morning, ERDT scholars, faculty advisors, presenters, participants. The session's plenary speaker, Dr. Erwin P. Enriquez, panel members, Dr. Marvin Sinense, Dr. Reynaldo Guerrero, Mr. Raymark Parocha, Mr. Robert Alpe Peña and moderator, Engineer Isabelo Rabuya. In spite of this very trying time due to this COVID-19 pandemic, not just here in our country, but the world as well, life goes on, doing our best, each of us making our contribution. It is in this context that ERDT organized this first online synchronous ERDT National Conference 2020 with the theme bouncing back into the new normal to continue what has been an annual face-to-face on-site conference where ERDT scholars and faculty advisors gather together to update each other of their respective researches, meet new friends, expand their network of colleagues, and explore areas of potential collaborative and joint studies. This is day one of the five-day conference, and today's session is the energy session. In addition to the plenary speaker, we have five speakers from four universities. De La Salle University, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, University of the Philippines, Diliman, and University of San Carlos. At the end of the presentations, the best paper for today's session will be selected as judged by the panelists. I will now introduce our plenary speaker. He is professor of chemistry and material science and engineering at the Ateneo de Manila University. He obtained his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and was postdoc at the materials research laboratory at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign before returning as Balik scientist. He was a fellow of the Leaders in Innovation Fellowship at the Royal Academy of Engineering and OYS of the NAST. And recently, his team was awarded the 2020 Julian A. Banzon Medal for Outstanding Research and Development in Applied Science. His current interests include nanofabric nanofabrication using solution processing techniques for various applications such as in DNA biosensors, solar energy generation, and printed electronics. Let us now all welcome to the virtual stage Dr. Erwin P. Enriquez. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, may I have a uh, sharing uh, privilege for so I can share my PowerPoint. Good morning to everyone and welcome to the ERDT conference. Um, okay, so here, um, let me just click. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, for the yes, uh, this is the part is the PowerPoint the whole screen? Not yet, sir. You, you can uh, put it in percent mode, nice. please. Not the whole screen. So try this one. Okay. So what about that one? 
Okay. Yes, yes. It's okay po. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I usually make that mistake to Zoom. So thank you again <laughs> for that uh, introduction and welcome everyone to the ERDT conference. So no matter what, Ms. Kim, my pandemic to lipa did ng research, you know. Uh, so I'm happy uh, to be here to present uh, some of the work that we have done on uh, printable photovoltaic cells. Since this is an energy symposium, so for uh, because we have been working on developing photovoltaic cells, um, I was invited by Dr. Makabebe to be a plenary lecturer here. So without further ado, uh, so. Basically, when we talk about uh, photovoltaic cells, we normally think of solar cells that are made of silicon, right? The ones that we see on rooftops or sometimes the ones that we see in our uh, compact devices. These are very fragile uh, solar cells and they're usually manufactured using traditional methods, uh, photolithography, um, using the typical electronics industry methods. But nowadays, uh, one of the emerging technologies uh, is the so-called print printed electronics. So basically printed electronics mean you can now print devices, just like uh, you, can, you print uh, documents on paper, you know, you can print three, three dimensional materials. You can also now start to print electronic devices. So this is one of the emerging technologies that uh, is combined with nanotechnology, uh, precisely because of some of the ink formulations that are needed, which I will demonstrate later in some of the works that we have done. And it is a major technology for the fourth industrial revolution. So printed electronics market is uh, making a market uh, impact. Uh, right now it's around, well, roughly 65 billion. We're still uh, in 2020, but it's still growing because a lot of the major industries are investing in it, such as something electronics, for example. So this is a market research uh, from ID Tech, and then they're predicting a rapid growth in printed electronics. And here's the distribution of the different devices that are benefiting from printed electronics. So note that the big chunk, the red one here is actually all in display. Well, precisely because maybe we have all our cell phones that are, you know, uh, OLED or light emitting diode. Uh, and, but there are other applications such as in conductors, uh, again, uh, ink formulations for conductors. Uh, there's photovoltaic there, but it's just a small market here but um, other uh, applications will be in sensor devices. Now, printed electronics have, uh, is becoming huge because uh, in the new industrial revolution, a lot of things will, or devices will be smarter, right? So people are talking about internet of things, devices that are everywhere, wearable. So this is really going to be a major player in making all of this happen. So printing is an additive manufacturing. So what do we mean by additive? So you add materials as a, uh, to be able to build your device. And because you only put material where you need it, it's not very wasteful. So this is one of the advantages of additive manufacturing. And what is the opposite of additive manufacturing? Subtractive. If you recall when, uh, when you want your uh, clothes to be cut by a tailor, basically it's subtractive because the tailor will make a pattern and throw away some of the materials that are not needed. In additive manufacturing, you only put material where you need them. And so some of the additive manufacturing techniques will include screen printing, gravure printing, inkjet printing, and roll-to-roll -roll printing. So for those who are not familiar with gravure, I've shown a diagram here, which I borrowed from this website. Uh, basically, you just have your pattern that uh, rolls on top of your substrate where you can print your pattern. But we're focused more on inkjet printing. Now, printed electronics will have some advantages over traditional publication methodologies. I've already mentioned because it's additive, it's very cost effective. Now, it will not compete with the current methods for making um, microelectronics, or actually now it's nano electronic devices because they're very, very small in features with very high resolution of fidelity, but where silicon microelectronics will not be cost effective, especially for large area applications, such as solar cells, for example. Uh, solar cells have not been very cheap, although the prices have dropped recently. For the longest time, it's not very, uh, it's not very cheap because you need large 
areas of silicon to be able to harvest a large amount of light, right? So for large area applications, uh, there's a disadvantage for, for those the traditional methods of fabricating electronic devices. Unlike uh, printed electronics because uh, of the low cost uh, use of materials and also printing is generally a low cost manufacturing technique compared with uh, uh, traditional techniques. So you can use it for RFID and so on and so forth. Now, another advantage will be the ability to be able to print on flexible substrates. So these are non-flat substrates. So if we're talking about wearable materials, so they should be flexible, right? And so here's an example of uh, what we've printed in our lab. So you can flex it on plastic. And then finally, ease of manufacturing. I put there an asterisk because it's not that easy yet. Is this still emerging technology? So there are already uh, development in making things a lot printable. So nowadays, I think we, maybe you've seen the newest um, uh, Samsung phone where it's foldable or laptop to with foldable LCD. So some of these are, uh, are probably done with uh, combined technologies, but there are still uh, challenges that I will talk about later that needs to be addressed. I'm just, I will show you here uh, a video where the printer that we use for our research is not your traditional uh, printer that you use at home. Although the technology behind it is similar. So this is usually run using a piezoelectric electric device that you know, ejects a few liters of graph that, but because we are using different chemical components, you cannot just use your plastic based uh, printer. So we have a chemical ink printer that we use in the lab. Now, printing is digital. You don't need the pattern. So you can just store the information and it will print it for you. And then uh, one advantage is you can do on the fly corrections. And obviously this is also important for rapid uh, prototype development. So here are some of the issues uh, that are still, we are facing, uh, especially those who are doing research in printed electronics. Well, one is optimization of printing. Uh, you want high quality printed, printed features, right? Uh, and in order to do that, you have to know how to treat the surface. It's just like when you're uh, writing on paper, right? If you don't have the right paper, your ink might uh, have blotches. So you have to match the substrate with the ink and also tune your ink formulation with respect to the substrate. Now, performance of devices are also, the performance of the devices is also affected. Uh, IV, the current voltage characteristics, as you will see, later in the examples that we have. And so this needs to be optimized with regards to the printing process or ink formulation, the performance of the circuits. And then of course, overall, there's a lot of uh, physics and fundamental electronics that is happening when you are making layered uh, materials or devices. So the, a lot of this needs special characterization such as atomic force microscopy, electron microscopy, and so on and so forth. So adv really advanced techniques uh, bordering on nanotech tools. Now, obviously, uh, because uh, many devices are made using traditional methods and printing is just an alternative. So people are still benchmarking the new method uh, against the traditional method. And lastly, uh, there are many printers nowadays, but people still continue to develop uh, printing equipment uh, one is to improve the resolution. The other one is to improve the ease of use, uh, such as the one that we have. Uh, it's not that easy yet to use, but still uh, a lot of improvements can be made along that line. So what I will be presenting uh, will be efforts that we have done at the Atene de Manila University, thanks to various funding that we got from PCRD USD, from ERDT, from the Commission Higher Education Chad and the Philippine California Advanced Research Institutes. And for the PICARI, we're actually partnered with uh, UC Berkeley, where one of our collaborators is a major world-renowned uh, researcher in printed electronics. So we were privileged to learn a lot from his group. So what I will be focusing on will be on energy generation. Uh, this will be photovoltaic cell based on dye-sensitized uh, photovoltaic architecture. And then later on, perovskite photovoltaic. I will discuss these terminologies uh, later. And then obviously, because I'm coming from the chemistry department, you might be wondering, I'm a chemist by training. I had some training in materials engineering, and now we have an electronics lab. If you visit our lab, we have characters, we have a semiconductor device um, analyzer, uh, we have circuit analyzers, 
we're making pin film transistors. In fact, our collaborator, Professor Vivek Subramanian, is in the electronics and computer science uh, department, but he has a chemistry lab. So maybe I'm sharing this to you now because uh, we are in an era where your, what you're learning in engineering needs to be complemented by other techniques. So we are now moving towards transdisciplinary kind of engagement when we do research. So uh, for those of you who are researching, you should also learn your chemistry or physics if you are in mechanical or electrical engineering. If you're in chemistry, you should also learn other aspects where your, your own field might be most useful to apply to. Okay, so let's go now to photovoltaic devices. Here's actually um, the NREL. This is like a roadmap. Uh, NREL is the National Renewable uh, Energy Laboratory based in Washington in the US. So they are the main, wait, uh, no way it's advancing. Um, they're the main uh, reference lab uh, when it comes to uh, tagging the efficiency of that. So what you are seeing here are the different uh, generations of devices or different types. So the purple ones are multi-junction cells and then they achieve very high efficiencies, but these are very expensive cells. Some of them are only used by NASA for uh, out, outer space uh, flight applications. For normal ones that we see in industry or at home, so it will be crystalline silicon cells. And I've highlighted here in yellow the development from the 1970s moving to the current time uh, in up efficiency. This is the power conversion efficiency. So notice that the, it's actually is relatively flat for many years, uh, 50 years, uh, around maxing around 24, 25%. So there's not a lot of development in terms of efficiency. Actually, you're reaching the so-called uh, theoretical limit for that. In the 1990s, uh, the green one that I'm tracking here, this is this belongs to the emerging photovoltaic. There you have disensitized uh, solar cell. So notice that it's reached around 15%, but it stopped there. Actually, this is followed by in 2014, one of the researchers doing uh, disensitized solar cell uh, stumbled upon a formulation where the efficiency lab rapidly increased. So this became the darling of photovoltaic research. Uh, I will talk about this again later in the next slides. Okay, so what is disensitized solar cell? It's a kind of a third gen photovoltaic that can achieve higher efficiencies depending on the semiconductor material that you use. But uh, what the advantages will be low cost manufacturing. This again, because it will be printable. Uh, it's unlike your normal photovoltaic cell, which is dry and fabricated in a dry environment. This is kind of a, can be solution process. It's amenable to low light conditions and like uh, silicon by solar cell, you need uh, a sort of a threshold uh, sunlight uh, before it, it, you can affect a good efficiency from it. Uh, and the manufacturing process, because it's printable, obviously it's amenable to Philippine conditions. Now, actually when this was uh, invented by Professor Gratzel in Switzerland, he, because of the promise of this device, he won the Millennium Technology Prize in 2010 in 2010 in Europe. But as I've shown you earlier, the this is kind of stuck where it, it was. But we started working on this actually early in the 2012, 2013. So these are the things that we've uh, developed uh, when we started working with high-sensitized solar cell. And I will explain how it works uh, based on this diagram. So notice that this is a layered structure, maybe roughly in terms of dimensions around the scale is micron. This is a very thin layer squeezed between two plates. At the bottom plate can be a conducting material or it can be a transparent conducting um, electrode, TCR oxide, TCO, uh, coating glass. And this is your cathode. And on the other side, this is also your glass with a transparent conducting oxide or coating. And because this is transparent, light can penetrate through, right? And in between these two uh, conductors with transparent uh, substrates, the glass, you have your active material. So what you have here is titania. The titania should be nanometer in size, so it's 10 to 30 nanometer. Very, very small. Nano is 10 to the minus nine alpha meter. So this is a very fine powder. Um, the titania is a white, uh, powder used in white toothpaste, although in white toothpaste it's probably not nano, probably micron size. And it's also used in uh, UV um, sunblock, 
lotion because it absorbs ultraviolet light. Now, the problem with titania, and it has semiconductor property. The band gap is in the UV region. So it absorbs in the UV region. So you have to sensitize it with a dye that absorbs in the visible region because most of sunlight is visible. So that's why it's called dye sensitized solar cell. So the semiconductor here is the nano titania. So when light shines the and light is absorbed by your dye, the dye transfers an electron to your titania, which uh, immediately separates the electron from the hole. So the hole moves this way and then the electron moves that way. So the electron can go to the external circuit powering your device and then back into the uh, medium. So the last electron is replenished by this uh, electrolyte, usually a tri-iodide system. And so you, the dye is regenerated back to its original state. And so all, all in all, it's just like a chemical battery, but nothing is controlled because everything will be regenerated uh, within the circuit. And it's only activated when light shines on it. So because this is a, just a pigment with some electrolyte solution, it's basically uh, paintable or even uh, solution processable. Okay, so one of the things that we have tried to develop, this is not our invention in the Philippines, is to work with a material called graphene. Graphene is a carbon conducting carbon material. And because of the development in graphene uh, research, we're able to do this. So I'll explain what we've done with uh, fluorine tin oxide graphene uh, to make the transparent component. And then uh, what, how we were able to improve the efficiency of uh, anthocyanin using natural dye and graphene and some efforts on the carbon part. And then later on, we move on to perovskite and I'll explain to you why. Okay, so nanocarbon dispersions. Uh, because we, we are moving towards a photovoltaic technology that might be printable or solution processable, uh, basically you just have to have a dispersion of your carbon, right? Dispersion in liquid. So what is uh, important here, carbon is black, uh, unfortunately, when you Google search carbon, you'll probably uh, be brought to uh, a site talking about greenhouse gases. That carbon refers to carbon dioxide. So there's, there's a kind of misnomer there. So now I'm talking about real carbon, which is elemental carbon. So in, when I was studying chemistry, there were only three kinds of carbon. You have your amorphous carbon and then diamond and graphite. So here's graphite and there's diamond. Diamond is the one of the hardest minerals, right? Uh, and then graphite is very soft because it's a layered structure of carbon, okay? And so one layer will just slide past one another. And then in the 1990s, this round shaped carbon buckyballs were, uh, was discovered. And then later on the nanotubes, okay? Now, my interest is in graphene because these are the ones that are easier to make. Actually, I'm going to show you a video where actually even the inventors or the discoverers of graphene, a single layer of this uh, uh, carbon uh, layer uh, was discovered using tape. So pencil lead is made of graphite. So if you start writing on paper, basically you are exfoliating or rubbing up uh, graphite layers, right? So when you put a scotch tape on what you've written using your pencil, you've actually transferred the thin layer of that graphite material on your tape. So when you apply a second tape on top of that tape and then you know rub it together and then fill that up, then on the other side you would have thinned it, right? So you just continuously doing this, uh, get another tape, rub it, and then uh, split the tape. Eventually you'll make it so thin so you would have isolated a single layer of graphene. And that's how uh, the scientists, uh, Nabasalov and uh, Gaim actually were able to isolate graphene by using tape, scotch tape. And then they won the Nobel Prize, not for that, but for discovering properties of graphene, obviously. And nowadays, there are many ways to produce graphene using evaporation techniques and so on and so forth. But what are one of the most important developments here is uh, you can prepare dispersions of graphene by liquid phase exfoliation. Exfoliation is a term where you basically you remove layers from from a surface. So graphite is a layered structure of uh, graphene, basically. And if you want to isolate single layers of graphene, you want solvent molecules to intercalate between the graphene layers. 
And by uh, choosing the right solvent, such as uh, N-metal pyrrolidone, if none of you are chemists, just, you know, just look at the acronyms. It's just chemicals with some polar characteristics. And then they can intercalate there. But you have to jiggle it with uh, high ultrasonic sound so that uh, the molecules will uh, intercalate through inner, inner and then be able to basically separate the different layers. So this is what we commonly use now to make graphene dispersion. So what we do in the lab is something like this. So we get, just get uh, graphite powder, uh, put it in a appropriate solvent such as NMT or SC, uh, sodium cholate, and then uh, ultrasonic yet so, uh, subject to ultrasonic energy. And then now, because not all the graphite will be converted to graphene, uh, this is not very efficient actually. There will still be a large chunks of graphite that you need to remove by ultracentrifugation. And then after removing the large chunks, you will have a uniform dispersion of your graphene. And then of course you can uh, still filter that and collect the filtrate where you will have your graphene dispersion. Now this method doesn't really produce single layer of graphene, but we call it pure layer graphene. There will be single layer, double layer. It's a mixture of uh, 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 tiny slices of graphite, but they're very close to a monolayer. So the properties are very close to graphene. So here's just some example of the dispersion. So these are now like inks, right? So we can use it to print, screen print, uh, inkjet print, and other, other things that we can do with it to make our devices. And we can actually, we've looked at the concentration based on just how dark it is from the uh, uh, turbidity. Okay, um, another source of carbon, uh, we're kind of happy that we stumbled upon this because uh, glycerol is a low value byproduct uh, from the coconut oil industry. And uh, one way, actually we have a, a big activated carbon industry in Mindanao where they use coconut husk and convert it to activated carbon. That carbon should have some graphene material, right? But um, it's not pure carbon, there's still some oxide. So we were thinking what, what can we do with this low value product maybe convert it to carbon i am running out of time so i'll just hurry up with this one so but what we have done is we're able to invent a process where this liquid which is normally volatile can be converted to carbon and actually applied for patent for that and the advantage is you don't need very high temperatures unlike for activated carbon low temperature you already have carbon and then when we characterize it, obviously you can formulate ink out of this, just like uh, I demonstrated. Uh, we've shown from transmission electron my microscopy and uh, from the diffraction pattern that we have actually graphitic uh, or graphenic uh, properties for carbon that we produce from this. So two things, you can use graphite or you can just produce your own carbon from natural resources and then produce uh, the carbon material that you want for your electronic device. So that's one good thing about this. Uh, you can actually source it from uh, natural materials. You don't have to rely just on uh, minerals that will have a finite uh, amount on earth. Okay, so, um, so Raman data, we have to prove that we have produced graphenic material. So Raman is a technique uh, that's used to, it's a verb, it examines the vibrational modes of carbon and uh, when you see the G peak, this is for graphite. Uh, these were some of the defects. So what we've actually produced is sort of a graphene oxide. So it's graphenic, but not pure graphene. But we're very close to what was uh, reported in the literature uh, published in carbon. So we know we've produced graphenic material from um, our carbon. Now, the next thing is to produce uh, a jettable ink because inkjet is our main tool for fabrication. So Professor Subramanian, our actually, he was my reference before he became our collaborator from Berkeley. I saw this article, the starting point in inkjet technology is satellite free droplets. There are requirements to be able to have a good print, but the first thing that we need to do is formulate the ink so that we can have jettable droplet. What do we mean by jettable droplet? So here's a zoom in of the nozzle of the printer. And we can actually position the camera so we can see the drops being jetted at certain frequencies, right? So when you have multiple droplets or tailings, these are 
these are bad ink formulations. What we want is an ink formulation that will give us a single drop every time so that we can have maximum uh, optimal reproducibility when we're printing. So this is uh, done by uh, controlling the solvent, the viscosity, the surface tension of the ink, and so on and so forth. And you also have to match with the substrate. So this just an example using our uh, graphene, uh, exfoliated graphene, we can actually produce a printed carbon electrode, just as shown here. This is uh, optical micrograph to 100 micron for five, five layer prints. Because you print single layer, it's still too thin, so you can print several. So we can print a carbon electrode using our ink. Now, one of the uh, applications for potable type is we, we combine graphene with a dye. For example, we have shown, this is our publication in the journal Solar Energy. Um, we can improve the efficiency. So anthocyanin is a natural dye that we can extract from fruits, from vegetables. And when we add graphene, it does improve the efficiency of the device. And another application of using graphene is, uh, this is just a recent publication, 2020. Although this is all work by Lansko, uh, uh, it's to make this uh, transparent conducting electrode. So normally we spray, we spray pyrolyzed fluorine doping oxide, but we add a little bit of graphene there to improve efficiency of the conductivity and transparency of the device. Okay, so uh, I'm running out of time. So a lot of the work uh, moving forward is concerning now the uh, publication of dye sensitized solar cell on flexible substrates. This is just a uh, example, current voltage diagram. We can make up to actually 6% efficiency. But what we're trying to do is to make everything at low temperature because when titania to be active has to be centered at high temperature. Normally uh, above, uh, let's skip this, uh, five, uh, above 400 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's the reason why we move into perovskite. So perovskite is uh, similar to the SSC, but the active layer uh, is the so-called perovskite. And the perovskite absorbs more light. So here's the spectral region of the sun. Here's uh, the best dye in dye sensitized solar cell. Notice that the perovskite absorbs more light. So it actually gives you more efficiency. So there's a lot of interest in perovskite. And this is the zoom in of that uh, NREL results. So here's the improvements in the efficiency of perovskite over the years. Actually, when we presented our work in the Materials Research Conference in Boston in 2017, a lot of the work have now focused on perovskite, very little work done on the SSC. There's still some the SSC, but people have just moved on to perovskite. So actually, one of uh, my graduate students, uh, Harry, went to LMU Munich uh, in Professor Bynes' work to train on publication of perovskite. So there he can make perovskite cells up to 11% efficiency. So we wanted to translate some of those techniques to what we can do, but lower uh, sintering temperature. So normally uh, the titania layer, the perovskite solar cell will also have titania layer. Uh, I apologize, we didn't have time to expound on the architecture, uh, uh, the electric layer, and then, then the perovskite. So there's also the carbon electrode, which can be replaced by gold. So some of these components require high temperature sintering, typically 400, 450. So we wanted low temperature sintering because if you want to transfer it on a flexible substrate. So here's an example of our print. Uh, this print, although this is on glass, we can actually do it on a flexible substrate, but this is still not very efficient. And one of the problems we've encountered is perovskite is uh, sensitive to humidity. So I will just skip some of this because I have only time up to 9.55, I think, for the Q&A. So uh, just, just to summarize that work by Harry Rodriguez who worked on perovskite. Our best perovskite cell was only 2% efficiency, but we are working in a humid environment. So the important thing here is we've lowered some of the processing temperature and we are working in a non-ideal environment. Uh, but we're still able to produce a working uh, uh, perovskite uh, device nonetheless. And in the latter part, the last part is the carbon electrode, right? So one of my researchers uh, then then tried to use our carbon from glycerol carbon block. And then by using impedance spectroscopy, we can uh, improve the conductivity. I just want to show this slide uh, because then then also presented in the MRS conference and I told 
then then said I told her uh, maybe we were not going to make any impact. But interestingly, these two guys I just took a, a stolen snapshot. I said, who are those guys asking you questions? They happen to be from NREL. Remember the National Renewable Energy Lab. So then we realized, well, ni naman pala irrelevant yung research natin. So this should tell you, ERDT scholars, that what you are doing here will also be relevant. So long as you choose the proper problem that you are working on. And then then had actually a lot of audience for her simple paper, which is basically the impedance studies that we've done on our carbon electrode. And so that's, that's nice to see. Although we still have to publish that. And then interestingly, in that same conference, I met some of the friends of Harry from Germany. And I met this uh, professor from China who, who told me that they were just starting to develop printable electronics uh, in their research center uh, sponsored by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So we're not too far off in the efforts that we're doing in terms of printable electronics. So here's some pictures of the ink formulations that we've done. Now, I just want to focus on the, one of our success stories because we're actually now selling this ink to a company in the US. So we've developed a green synthesis for starch gold nanoparticle ink. Remember, one of the electrodes could be gold. And so because gold ink is quite expensive, so we said, why don't, why don't we just make it ourselves because we are chemists. So we stumbled upon a method and we published it in 2018. And that turns out to be a gold ink that uh, very jettable, can print nicely, and it's already highly conducting even at 150 degrees Celsius. Actually, when we look at the square resistance, uh, versus temperature at 120, the uh, conductivity is already very good. Uh, and actually, normal ink that you can buy from the market is about $1,000 per gram ink. We'll need 250 degrees in turning. Our can only center at very low temperature. So actually, it's Nova Centrix. We sent Lance, one of our researchers, to Texas. And then this is shown to be flash interval. So Nova Centrix is actually buying ink from us now. Well, I said to my students, if it's not going to be successful, well, this is just a joke, but there's probably also promise it. If it's not for electronic devices, maybe we'll just make very expensive wedding invitations with our gold ink. Notice that as soon as it dries, it turns gold already. I'll end my talk here. So just to summarize, uh, printing up electronic devices is a new technology and it can be used for making photovoltaic devices. Uh, nano ink formulation is an important industry in itself because it's important for this uh, manufacturing technique. And we have demonstrated that we can do low temperature processing uh, for the photovoltaic cells. Actually, I heard Alpi Peña is here. So actually we work on other stuff uh, uh, using uh, the, our collaboration in Berkeley. So I just want to mention that. So here's a lab. And of course we thank our support funding agencies and actually, a lot of it's funded by our Chad Picari group. There's Professor Subramanian and his team in Berkeley and our team here uh, in the presenters, There's our Dr. Alpi Peña now. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Erwin Enriquez for that very enlightening presentation. I am Isabella Rabuya. I am the moderator for this session on energy. Now, we have two questions uh, posted in our Q&A box. Uh, let me go to the second uh, posted question first. Um, is there already IP or intellectual property protection that has been applied for your work? Yeah, actually for, for the carbon ink from glycerol, we've already applied patent for the assistant as well. But of course, patent takes a long time to happen. So it's just still there uh, being uh, deliberated upon. And then for the gold ink formulation, we've applied several invent invention patents for the process. Uh, well, we were very interested because it turned out the ink formulation is kind of new, and that's why that uh, American U.S. company is interested in. We well, actually we we're making it for them. So they don't want to make it themselves yet, but later on maybe they can get license the technology for making it. So yes, we have applied patents for this. For some of the design architectures, we did not apply for patent. Uh, in the Ateneo, our intellectual property office will 
first think if there is commercial viability, then that's when you apply for patent. Otherwise, if there's nothing that you can commercialize it with, uh, you don't apply for patent. You are not actually applying for patent to commercialize to make huge profits. Uh, the reason for commercialization is to be able to be able to deploy. Uh, if this will benefit a lot of people, yeah, some some company should produce it, mass produce it, right? And mass production should be sustainable. So there should be a business of producing important devices or product that can be deployed to the masses. And that's why patent is important because uh, you want to also protect those who will invest uh, money to, to, to make these devices. So it's not just for profit. It's also for protecting and making it at reasonable prices for your target end users. Okay, thank you very much. So yeah, because we understand that maintaining a patent is also very expensive yeah, so mm -hmm. if, if there's no investor, but I'm pointless trying to maintain it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that question, uh, Jerry Halibas. Now let me go to the first posted question, although uh, this is posted by Romel Arubang. Uh, the question is on, with the recent advances in solar technologies, what should be done to fast pace? or mainstream the adaptation of solar energy in our country? What are the constraints that hinder solar energy utilization? Now, uh, to Mr. Arubang, uh, I understand that the area of research of Dr. Enriquez is not really on the uh, solar PV industry, but it is on the on research on printed electronics to come up with uh, advanced technologies that will be useful in the coming years. So, uh, Mr. Arubang, if, is, if it is uh, okay, can I maybe uh, rephrase your question uh, to Dr. Enriquez now that uh, in your view, viewpoint, uh, Dr. Enriquez, uh, with the current uh, efficiency now at like 2% of these uh, printed solar cells, when do you think uh, utilization of this technology will reach a level that we can say it can be mainstream and it will get popular in terms of application like the manufactured solar PV cells that we have now being used in uh, like solar farms? Yes, uh, actually, the, this is a very important question. Uh, and over the years, because we've worked on uh, photovoltaic cells and we've also met some of the people in the industries. And actually, I've visited the Solar Energy Institute in Singapore and also in Paris, France. And I've asked them the same questions. Um, the, 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 I think the problem with uh, solar energy is because it's renewable energy trying to compete with uh, other sources of energy, right? So it's always price competition that's critical. For the solar industry, I know what has happened for silicon industry, for example, the prices have, will have gone up for some time when oil prices were up. So solar silicon industry were, was booming, right? And then China produced a lot of cheap solar cells, so they dumped it into their markets. So a lot of companies went bankrupt or they have to reduce their production because there's an oversupply. And that, when that happened, actually, the research also kind of waned uh, dwindled because well because there's now cheaper technology but research should always continue just because uh later on maybe you will stumble upon something that will be more competitive or more compelling so to answer your question uh when we attended that mrs conference that's also the big question of the big research community and perhaps skype uh, we produce only 2% efficiency cell, but the highest on record will already be reaching almost close to what a silicon can produce, I think, uh, depending on the architecture. So it's just a problem of, because it's new, so and you don't have companies who are invested in producing this, that they cannot compete against what's already out in the market. Because silicon solar cells have dropped in prices, so therefore this new technology cannot immediately compete against that. So I don't know how to predict it. I just remember before, uh, when you look at display technologies, before we have liquid crystal displays, right? 
and then light emitting uh, diode type displays were very expensive and originally they couldn't compete with LCD just because a lot of people are producing cheap LCDs but later on this was uh, overtaken by LED and then even organic light emitting diode in the 2000 2000 the industry had a problem because they were producing not very stable uh, organic uh, diodes but nowadays it's everywhere right so if i will base the the tracking on these types of technologies that happened before maybe we'll wait another 10 years before maybe this technology can uh, at least it will not displace silicon based technology uh, but will be more widespread probably. More likely for indoor use uh, portable uh, so, uh, devices uh, because silicon has already been proven to be cheap for outdoor use and for generating large uh, power requirements at home or in industries. Yes, uh, I remember that uh, the first solar cells that uh, I noticed that were being applied were in calculators. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there was a year then when we had the calculators that had solar cells. So maybe uh, printed electronic solar cells will also start with uh, devices that mm -hmm. use uh, just a small amount of power, like eventually mm -hmm. when we have wearable devices. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So it will create, be, there will be a niche for it, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So we have here another question. Uh, what is the role of graphene and anthocyanin in solar cells? Is uh, I I think because it was in the news lately about the uh, Mapua University, the stu a student of Mapua University. I think was it also anth anthocyanin that was being used in that uh, uh, product development of theirs uh, using waste uh, fruits. Uh, to develop a dye? Is this the same? And what is the role of graphene and anthocyanin? Well, actually, if you think about it, the, the biggest harvester of light on Earth will be plants, right? Photosynthesis. <laughs> this is where we, all animals, we get our energy from plants. If we don't have plants, we will all not have our source of food. But photosynthesis, per se, is not very efficient. Uh, it's efficient for the growth of the plant, for at least for sustaining life on Earth. But for the energy demands that we have now in our current lifestyle, it will not be enough. Uh, so, but the point is, plants have already produced naturally these materials that can harvest light. So, examples will be the photosynthetic pigment. I'm not too sure about what the Mapo West student used, but probably this will be again a, a visible light absorbing pigment that you can extract from plant. So anthocyanins happen to be the purple pigments. These are the ones in red cabbage or in duhat. Uh, these are not the green pigments. And then they absorb uh, well in the uh, region of sunlight, around 500 uh, green region where you have a lot of uh, intensity. And so these are the ones that absorb light. So when something absorbs light, that means an electro electron gets excited. In energy so if you remember your chemistry or physics so an electron that gets excited can be passed on to an external circuit in in this case it happens to be a titanium dioxide which is a semiconductor device an electron is captured by the titania and it's quickly uh, sent by titania to the external circuit electrode basically titania is an excellent electron hole uh, separator you have to be able to extract that electron from from the uh, dye, basically. Um, so that's the rot. Now, the problem with that electron, it has to pass through an electrical, basically electricity, you know, electric uh, current, right? So when we added a little bit of graphene in the titania or with anthocyanin, basically we've created a, a nice conductive path where electrons can be shot through, through the medium so that it can be passed into the external circuit. So that's how we quickly explain how adding a little bit of graphene in anthocyanin or in the titania layer or even in the FTO improves uh, conductivity. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Enriquez. Now, one last question, uh, because we have here schools in the ERDT consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, if, like the other universities, get interested into doing research also on printed electronics, is this a 
very expensive uh, research area in terms of equipment? Or do you think uh, Philippine universities can also uh, uh, start uh, doing research and build their resources in order that maybe help the Philippines someday with uh, researchers like you leading the research on this area and uh, having other Filipino researchers also contributing to the effort so that we can eventually make a, a global impact. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question actually. Uh, when we had that Chad Picari project, oh, one of my main goal was not to just uh, go to Berkeley and then do the research here. Because if we do that, then we are not building capability here. So what we learned from what and what we really aimed in our Chattikari project is to build a laboratory here to be able to have the capability to do everything that they're doing here. Right now, we're fully capable. Remember, we are selling an, an, an high-tech ink to a, a company in the US who's uh, specializing in printed electronics. And this is our own contribution and we, we've just started very recently and so that means the, uh, the cost for investment in this type of technology is not very high actually although Chad Picari was a substantial grant but a lot of that was put into you have to have the tools to be able to characterize the ink but if you do that you will not produce a successful ink you have to have the tools but some of these tools are not very expensive some of them are available in ITDI Actually, in our department, when we had that Chattikari project, we held two uh, workshops where invited people from Mindanao, uh, Visayas, Luzon. We actually held workshops. And then some of these people who attended workshops were, are now my friends. Uh, and then I think they're engaging in some kind of uh, solution process technologies uh, related to maybe printing. So collaboration is also possible uh, for those who we have our laboratory. If you're coming up with something that might be useful, we can collaborate with you, obviously. So yes, and you can build your own lab. It's not very expensive. Uh, when I started here, I just bought my own Epson printer and then just changed it so that I can print chemicals. But those are not very uh, reliable because it's makeshift. Lang siya. But some of the, uh, you can actually even work with uh, printers at home and just modify it. If you just want to begin, but yeah. obviously what we have is a little bit more research grade thanks to the funding that we got. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Enriquez, for that very interesting and uh, enlightening presentation. It's good to know that we are doing that kind of research here in our country. So, Thank you. yeah. So we will proceed to the next part uh, of our session. Um, it's now 10.14. Let us just have a quick three-minute break and then after that we start with the uh, first paper presentation. So let us all come back at 10.17. So just a quick uh, maybe toilet break, get uh, water before we start with our paper presentations. Thank you very much.
good morning again to our to all our ER national uh, ERDT national conference uh, 2020 participants. So let us uh, all settle down so that we can start with our paper presentations. The so let us uh, start now with the first paper. The title for our uh, first presentation is Energy Audit on Lighting and Air Conditioning of Laboratories for Energy Cost Savings by Simulations in Dialux and Equest. This will be presented by Bjorn Ivan G. Ofrasio from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Uh, Mr. Ofrasio, you can now uh, start sharing your screen and start with the presentation. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Can you share your screen? Okay. Uh... Okay. Yes, there. No. Uh, please uh, put it in percent mode. That's, that's it. Thank you. You may start now. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Engineer Ivan of Russia. I'm just part of the Energy Audit team who conducted this study. And this study is entitled Energy Audit on Lighting and Air Conditioning of Laboratories for Energy Cost Savings by Simulations in Dialux and Equest. So we are now in a pandemic, and most of us are forced to work and study from home. However, we may wonder uh, if... Uh, we consume uh, much more uh, electricity than we usually have. And is it possible that we can conserve uh, energy, but at the same time uh, produce sufficient amount of lighting and uh, temperature, especially when we are using uh, air conditioning units? It is possible. However, uh, I will show you how, but I will show you uh, later. By the way, I am Ivan of Russia. I'm just part of the energy audit team who conducted this, uh, this energy audit. Among, uh, uh, along with electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, I am a chemical engineer, and with our advisors who are experts on this field. So to give you a brief uh, uh, outline for the, for the presentation, I will introduce what is energy management and the energy audit, and I will discuss uh, what is the procedure to uh, do energy audit. Then I will discuss uh, our findings and what are our recommendations, and I will wrap this all up into a, a conclusion. So for introduction, uh, uh, energy management. When we say energy management, uh, we need to balance two things, conserving energy uh, by whatever uh, driving force that we want or consume energy. Of course, we all depend on consuming energy. And when we consume energy, we we need to adhere to standards. For lighting, for example, it needs 300 lux of uh, lighting at least when, uh, when we do uh, work in our tabletops. And when we operate air conditioning units, uh, we need 23 to 25 degrees Celsius so that the, the uh, air conditioning unit uh, operation will be uh, energy efficient. However, we also want to reduce our bills. So how do we uh, balance these two things off? One way is to do energy audit. So energy audit is just uh, checking the, the energy practices and energy consumption practices of uh, inside the room or inside the building to determine the causes of inefficiencies and to determine uh, the implementing measures in order to save energy and at the same time uh, adhere to these standards. 300 lux and 23 to 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, what are our objectives? Why did we perform an energy audit? In, uh, generally, we want, to, uh, we want to recommend measures in order to save uh, energy, to provide energy conservation measures. Uh, in particular, we want to determine its energy consumption profiles, to determine the causes of uh, lighting issues, also temperature issues, 
and to recommend upgrading measures or recommendations. So how do we know if uh, the recommendation is okay? The criteria for that is it should have lower EI and it should have energy savings. EI or energy efficiency index is just the energy consumed to perform standard functions. So if it has lower EI, it should consume less to perform its standard function, it's better. And for energy savings, uh, of course, we want to reduce our electricity bills. So it should uh, reduce electricity bills. How? How did we do, uh, how did we check our recommendations by simulation? We actually audit two laboratories, Microlab and DSP Lab. So these are all electronics uh, engineering laboratories. Why? Because they're interesting. Uh, and laboratories are the busiest uh, rooms inside an academic building. And also, uh, most of them, they work for more than eight hours a day. So it's very interesting to see their energy consumption profiles. So how did we do the energy audit? We now proceed to methods. So there are three parts, data collection, data analysis, and recommendations. For data collection, we measure the, uh, the room envelope, and then we determine the light, lighting and the temperature at each grid, at each zone inside the room. And then we analyze it using distribution maps to determine the causes of uh, these uh, uh, inefficiencies and to determine EEI. And then afterwards, we uh, recommend something based from their uh, temperature or lighting issues, which are simulated using EQUES and dialogues. Uh, why simulate it? Because we want to know if it really conserves uh, energy or not. So we simulated it using Dialux and Equest. Dialux is used for lighting distribution profiles, and Equest is used for, uh, for uh, generally energy consumption simulation. Now let's go to results. First is lighting. As you can see here, this is the, these are the 3D views of the laboratories, Microlab and DSP lab, lab divided into three, uh, divided into two. So as you can see here, uh, this is the minimum standard. It should be in red color. However, none of them achieve it, right? It's because of these dark spots right here. As you can see in the gray areas in the grid, uh, these are the dark spots here and here. So as you have noticed, uh, most of them is all due to the wall colors. So the wall, uh, the, the selection of wall colors also affects the lighting uh, inefficiency. So uh, we determine the lighting distribution issues, such as shadowing in which uh, the luminaires are not in line with the desks, dark paints in which uh, we need to select uh, the right amount of color so that it will bounce off a light properly uh, to bounce off on our tabletops. Busted lamps, some lamps are left unreplaced and low lighting areas. Now we formulate recommendations based on, this, uh, based on these uh, issues. And then as you can see, these are now all uh, brighter. Their tabletops are now uh, much more uh, luminescent, uh, much more uh, uh, glowing. Now the lighting recommendations, uh, for our lighting recommendations, we recommend a lower, uh, lower power input but higher lumen output lamps such as LEDs. So LEDs are much more, uh, 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 bet are better nowadays. Then we, we also recommend a lower luminar mounting. Uh, some, uh, some luminaires are needed to be rewired. We need to re rearrange desks to be aligned with luminaires and uh, white wall paints. And some also needs to uh, install ceiling panels. So it will decrease EEI by 17 to 19%. So now you know already the tricks to uh, lighting recommendations. Now let's go to, uh, okay, now let's go to investment. So the investment ranges from 17,000 to 23,000 pesos. However, the payback period is within one to seven years. Now you already know the lighting, uh, the tricks to have an efficient lighting uh, profile. Now let's go to temperature and energy consumption. <clears throat> now the energy consumption, uh, the, the highest among them is the microlab. 
mainly because it has the the highest number of operating com computers and the uh, highest number of occupants. Also, the heat load also is uh, influenced by computers and occupants. As you can see, about 70 to 75 percent of uh, the heat load is contributed by occupants and computers. And you can see here in our ten, in the ten temperature distribution map, uh, you can see here the blue colors here are all the AC units, and the more red the color is, the redder the color is, the hotter the place is. So as you can see. Uh, some areas are very cool because it is uh, near AC units. However, some uh, AC units uh, do not operate well. That's why their areas uh, are very hot. So some temperature distribution issues uh, includes uh, performance of air conditioning units, such as ACU leaks, defects. Some set points are not, uh, are not achieved. And some uh, AC units are, are misdesigned. Also, other issues include air leaks, which uh, leaks out of the room, and the sunlight, in which uh, the, the larger the area of the window is, the higher the sun will penetrate, the, uh, the more heat will uh, it absorb. Now, we recommend, uh, uh, we recommend measures for microlab and DSP lab. First is for microlab, we recommend airflow optimization by sealing this uh, leaks and window blinds, installing window blinds, which will lower the EI by 27%, but will lower further to 52% when we install a new uh, AC unit, uh, air conditioning unit. For the SP Lab 1, uh, we could reduce EI by 58 to 59% by airflow sealing, AC relocation, and installing ceiling panels. For DSP Lab 2, it needs airflow optimization uh, in minimum by seals and blinds alone. And then we also want to repair AC. It will decrease uh, its EI by 7%. When we install ceiling panels, it will decrease by 8%. And when we uh, install new air conditioning units, it will decrease for the energy consumption further by 16%. It has, it has high investment, as you can see here from 27,000 to 200,000 pesos. However, it also has high annual savings, as you can see at the far right. So it has a short payback period only, high investment, but short payback period. Within two years, within one to two years, you will have uh, your uh, uh, investment paid back to you already because of the savings. Now to wrap this all up, you already know that uh, there are issues with regards to lighting, like low light lighting output, dark walls, desk layout, temperature issues like air leaks and airflow optimization and misuse of uh, air conditioning units. Air energy consumption is uh, a function of uh, occupants over time and number of active electrical devices. Now the trick to, uh, to have a, a, an efficient lighting is to have aligned desk to luminaires, to have highly reflective walls, install ceiling panels and uh, the luminaire mounting should be uh, 2.3 meters above the uh, floor and install LED lamps, which are uh, have low power but higher lumen rating. For thermal distribution measures, we need to keep the airflow in the room, install ceiling insulation uh, to make the room cooler and rearrange or install AC with correct uh, rating. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present here. Uh, I hope everyone will get uh, knowledge to, uh, uh, to be applied at, at our homes when we are uh, working from home. Thank you very much. Now I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Alfrasio, for your presentation. So while we are waiting for questions from our participants, um, okay, we have one here from Mr. Jerry Halibas. So I have a question for you, but let us have this one first. Uh, was there, the question goes like this, was there an actual proven result of this simulation method? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for asking that, no. Uh, the short answer is uh, no, because uh, the reason why we are simulating is because ayo natin gumastos. <laughs> Kasi kita nyo naman, sobrang mahal. 
Ayan, sobrang mahal niya. So, uh, we cannot prove it right away. Pero, uh, uh, that's why we simulate it using uh, a black box software, such as eQuest and Dialogs. eQuest in particular, ayun, uh, we, uh, they tend to uh, make the make it more ac- as accurate as possible. So, lahat ng AC, uh, for example, AC, uh, AC specs, nilagay namin doon para masimulate niya uh, we hope accurately kung ano yung magiging energy savings. Pero ang gist naman ng lahat ng to is uh, to compare it if uh, nagsasave talaga siya or hindi. And it proves that it saves. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. So we have another question from Dr. Al Tonko. Ivan, what advice can you give to architects and building designers based on the study that you have uh, done? Uh, yes, uh, thank you po, uh, Dr. Tonko. No? Uh, for architects and building designers, actually, uh, we studied the uh, energy management and ito yung, uh, ito yung reason for all of this because we want to uh, have uh, energy efficient uh, lighting. So, ang, ang recommendations for them is to, uh, for example, uh, uh, we need to establish kung ano yung function talaga ng room. For example, if it is an office and ang recommendation ko for that is, for example, in office, kailangan we need a standard amount of lighting for our tabletops. So, ang tabletops natin should receive at least 300 lux of lighting. So, it should design, uh, uh, they, should, they should design their uh, inside their, the buildings in such a way na they will receive this uh, kind of uh, amount of lighting. And also, uh, for temperature, for air conditioning units, they should also compute ba- based from ASHRAE standards of uh, kung, ano, kung sino yung estimate number of occupants for that uh, room or for that building and then to estimate uh, kung ano yung maging equipments within that room and to implement it to recommend uh, kung, ano yung magiging, uh, kung ano yung magiging proper air conditioning unit and uh, for it, for that room. Yun po. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have and another question, but unfortunately, we are running out of time for this presentation. So, um, I can uh, type the answer, po, sir. Yeah, uh, engineer of Russia can just type the answer to the posted question. Thank you very much, uh, engineer of Russia, for your yes, presentation you. in this uh, conference. Yes, sir. thank you, po, sir. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. So let us now go to the next uh, paper presentation. The title of our next presentation is Production and Characterization of Sol Gel Processed Microencapsulated Lauric Acid Based Phase Change Material from Treated Waste Coconut Oil. So this study will be presented by um, Paulo Ives L. De Silos from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. Uh, Paulo, uh, we have seen that your screen is now ready. So you may start. You may now start with your presentation. So uh, good morning, everyone. I am Paulo Ives De Silos. Uh, I'm currently a PhD in energy engineering student. Uh, at the University of the Philippines, Diliman. So today I will present my paper entitled Production and Characterization of Soldier Process Microencapsulated Lauric Acid Based Phase Change Material from Treated Waste Coconut Oil. So my co authors in this paper are Dr. Rizalinda De Leon and Dr. Minandro Berana, also from uh, the College of Engineering uh, in UP Diliman. So uh, Coconut oil is widely used in the Philippines as a primary cooking material. It's a large amount of waste. Cooking oil uh, produced in a day-to-day period. So, kasama na dun yung sa household and yung sa industrial scale. There is a need to determine possible uses for this uh, waste product to promote sustainability and interconnectivity with proper waste management and renewable energy systems. The formulation and production of environmentally viable waste material is vital to ensure phase, uh, to ensure uh, vi- uh, ensure waste minimization and energy security. 
Bogor studies have already been done to determine the capability of forming uh, TCM or phase change material from lauric acid. So uh, coconut oil is actually composed of 50% lauric acid. So as you can see the uh, importance of using lauric acid as a phase change material uh, is uh, significant. So the unique characteristics of lauric acid that makes it feasible for further studies are its low vapor pressure, low degree of supercooling, high heat of fusion, and compatibility with encapsulating material. Hence, it can prevent or at least delay the fluctuations of temperature and reduce the load of the cooling equipment for energy efficiency. So, so uh, objectives of the study. So first is to determine the effect of drying temperature and drying time in the product weight, diameter encapsulation ratio, and latent heat of melting of the microencapsulated phase change material from the extracted lauric acid obtained from the treated waste coconut oil. The second is one is to characterize the morphology of the uh, MPCM using scanning electron microscopy, identify the functional, functional groups present in the MPCM using uh, Fourier transfer infrared spectroscopy, and of course, to determine the uh, thermal properties of the MPCM using differential scanning calorimetry. So uh, generally, the steps done in this uh, research uh, was first to uh, the treatment of the waste coconut oil, which includes the treatment part, uh, basically uh, filtration and cleaning of the waste coconut oil collected, the acid catalyzed esterification and alkali catalyzed transesterification. The second one is the extraction of lauric acid using sodium hydroxide and the micro encapsulate, uh, encapsulation of lauric acid, which uh, in this paper, we use soldier process using tetraethyl orthosilicate as the silicate source and absolute ethanol. So to, to determine the effect of drying time and drying temperature in the uh, microencapsulation process of the phase change material, uh, various drying time and drying temperatures were uh, produced in the microencapsulation process. So for so we use uh, technical grade coconut oil and technical grade lauric acid uh, in the production of uh, MPCM also. Uh, of the scope of the characteristics, both for the chemical, thermal, and physical properties. Here's a figure of the uh, basic uh, soldier process, uh, microencapsulation process that we applied. So the response variables that are monitored in each run uh, were the encapsulation ratio, product weight, latent heat of melting, and the diameter. For the determination of the encapsulation ratio, the equation uh, was applied. So the latent heat of melting of the phase change material uh, Ratio of, uh, sorry, ratio of the latent heat of melting of the phase change material and that of the late uh, lauric acid uh, was uh, so this latent heat of melting were obtained from the uh, thermograms produced from the differential scanning calorimetry. For the results, uh, yeah. For the physical properties, uh, the microencapsulated phase change material with short drying time and high drying high temperature got the highest yield, and the MPCM with longer drying time and low temperature had the longest diameter. So attached is an SEM image of the MPCM from the waste coconut oil uh, at 50, 500, 1,000, and 5,000 magnification. For the chemical properties, so there is consistency in the diffs found from 0 to 2,500 uh, per cm from the various uh, MPCM. Lower detection of lauric acid in the MPCM may be attributed to the ineffective encapsulation, which may uh, result to leakage. So uh, the more, the greater the leakage, so the harder to handle the, the MPCM per se. 
And the peaks observed were the bending vibration of SIO, SIOH, functional group, and the OH stretching and vibration. So attached is the interest spectra of the micron capsulated uh, PC, uh, PCMs. For the thermal properties of MPCM, uh, again, differential scanning calorimetry was, uh, was applied. So a fast drying with high temperature resulted to a low latent heat of melting. So hence, drying using the 7 hours drying time is more practical. So at constant drying temperature, an increase in drying time resulted in an increase in the latent heat of melting of the MPCM. While at constant drying time, an increase in the drying temperature also resulted in an increase in the latent heat of melting of the MPCM. So attached is uh, just a summary of the uh, data collected from the various uh, setups. So using two sample t-tests, drying time of the MPCM is significant for the product weight and the diameter. Uh, on the other hand, drying time is significant for the product weight, diameter, and calculation ratio, and latent heat of melting of the MPCM. So ito yung mga nakita namin, or well, kaya namin conclude or well, to summarize. So waste coconut oil can be treated to remove the impurities brought by cooking. Lauric acid from the treated waste coconut oil can be extracted. Microencapsulation of lauric acid for easier handling and prevention of leakage. Drying time and drying temperature affects the MPCM weight, diameter, latent heat of melting, and encapsulation ratio. The MPCM from waste coconut oil can be used as an insulator for its high melting point. I thought it's just a reference the reference tricks used. So we would like to thank the Engineering Research and Development for Technology or ERDT for uh, funding the said research paper. Thank you, ERDT. Again, this is uh, my co-authors, Dr. Celine de Leon and Dr. Melanda Baran from UPDLM and also. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mr. Disilos, for that presentation. So we are now accepting questions uh, through our Q&A box. And also for our panelists, you can uh, type it in the chat box. So we have a question from our panelists. First, is the MPCM from waste coconut oil comparable to technical grade cocoa oil? Uh, so in terms of the uh, density, uh, density, viscosity, and the uh, refractive index of the coconut oil, the, both, the treated and from, uh, from, both from the treated one and that of the uh, technical grade are uh, almost similar to one another. So, ayun. so the treatment steps uh, was uh, was applied. Yung, yung from the yung the usual by diesel from waste cooking oil. Uh, kung, uh, yeah, you heard those studies. So yung steps na ginagamit sa pagclean nun, yun din yung inapply namin sa akin. Second question po. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... So, uh, wait for a while. So we have a question from the uh, participants. We have from Min Del Barrio. What are the other possible future studies related to your research? Or maybe based on the research that you have done, what are your recommendations so that uh, these studies can be taken further? Thank you. So actually, hit ako yung second question kanina. So medyo related doon kasi yun yung sa recommendation namin, which was actually to determine uh, yung sa costing. Well, actually, uh, sa recommendation, the plan was to design a plant, a plant design for feasibility study. So para medyo mas malinaw yung costing and to know if it's viable enough para mag-proceed sa stage na yun. So thank you. Okay, so uh, that was for the question no, we have here. Uh, the second question from our panelists. Uh, 
um, Dr. Simon says. So we have how much will it cost for the whole process from cocoa oil waste to micro encapsulation? So, uh, so you have uh, given your thoughts on that question. So, how about this uh, question? This is coming from Min Del Barrio. What are the other possible future studies related to your research? Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, future studies first would be yung uh, pagkakaroon ng feasibility study. Ah, uh, pangalawa. Uh, determination ng uh, paggamit naman ng other uh, uh, oil sources. Kasi sa Pilipinas ang ginagamit natin uh, mostly again nga is coconut oil. Pero ginagamit din kasi yung palmitic oil at saka vegetable oil. So uh, uh, sa recommendation namin was tingnan natin baka naman pwede rin yung dalawang type na yon Lalo na kung abundant naman sila miski, pababa yung component nila ng lauric acid. Okay, thank you very much. So, yeah, we, um, we do not have questions anymore from our, do we have uh, more questions from our panelists? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Disilos, for your presentation presentation for this conference. Thank you, Thank you. So we are now going to our uh, third presentation. The presentation is titled <clears throat> Investigation of Heat Transfer Efficiency of tungsten carbide and cobalt oxide nanoparticles dispersed on distilled water as base fluid. This will be presented by John Michael I. Marikit from Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. Mr. Marikit, can we have your screen? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is the ERDT Secretariat. Mr. Marikit couldn't make it today po due to internet connection issues, so we're going to play the pre-recorded video that he sent us. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am Ann, John Marikit is uh, already here. So will we proceed with the recorded presentation or will we have the live presentation? Okay. Good morning so we'll again, proceed. sir. We'll proceed though, po. Yes, po. Okay, we'll proceed with the recorded presentation and maybe uh, live for the question and answer. Yes, but we'll start with the beginning again soon. We'll restart the video. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. We are experiencing uh, technical difficulties with the uh, presentation of uh, Mr. Marikit. So to the ERDT Secretariat, can we just please proceed to uh, the next uh, paper presentation and uh, we can go back to the presentation of Mr. Marikit later. Is this yes, fine? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Thank you very much. So we'll proceed to the next paper. The title of the next presentation is Development of Hybrid, Hybrid Convection Solar Dryer for Seaweeds or Capapaikos alvarisi S. This will be presented by um, Mr. Riniel Z. Rocaberte from Central Luzon State University. Mr. Rocaberte, can you now uh, share your screen so that we can start with your presentation? Uh, Mr. Caberte is here, however, he might be <laughs> taking a break, no? Um, actually, I'm here, sir. I'm just... Ah, okay. Okay, wait lang. Just wait lang po, sir. Ha, I'm just... Okay, see, so, sorry then because <laughs> <laughs> we have been thrown out of schedule, but uh, okay. thank you for your sorry patience. Sorry for... It's okay. okay. Okay, thank you. You may now start. Please uh, uh, put your presentation into full screen mode. Okay, you may now start. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, to our technical panelists and to all who, who are with me today, a pleasant morning. I am Reniel Zabalero Caberte, and I'm honored to present to our to all of you our conducted research entitled Development of hybrid convection solar dryer for seaweeds, Kafa ficus albarasi. Um, together with me in this research is Professor Marvin Sinense, Professor Roel Pinera, and Professor Jeffrey Lavarias, all from Central Luzon State University. So uh, this research can um, conceptualize to address the problem encountered by the local seaweeds farmers in dealing with the seaweeds processing particularly in seaweeds drying. Likewise, it's based on the need of more efficient and practically cost-effective drying system during cloudy and rainy seasons. So to begin with, with I would like to bring you first, what is the seaweeds? So seaweeds is, is vital for, for, human for human life because of its nutritional benefit and um, multiple uses. So the, the seaweed scaphophycus albaresi is one of the major variables that use for more to make carrageenan. So this carrageenan, also known hydrocolide, which is natural extract from seaweeds, and it is used as gelling agent, thickener, and stabilizer for food and non-food applications, cosmetics, and pharmaceutical products. Um, our country, as you saw in the previous, our country is one of the top producing in terms of raw dried seaweeds. And these seaweeds are traded to global market and as dry. And it needs to facilitate um, as dry to facilitate the efficient transportation and product logistics. It is need the so in the in the processing. Um, stage, um, as you can see po in my presentation, that um, the drying practice is actually in a conventional method currently. So it needs an innovations, particularly to address the post-harvest losses. So 
proceed with um, this, all of this are I know, dependent with the weather. So, and also um, extremely, the seaweed is extremely perishable commodity. And since it is directly exposed to sun and exposed to other foreign materials. So the utilizations of seaweeds is primarily for human consumption and food and pharmaceuticals, which needs the product quality. Um, that's why the global market rising the concern about the product, product quality. Um, as you can see on the, that, that we need the innovation. So what, what is the innovation needed in this particular sector? So um, the hybrid convection solar dryer for seaweeds is, can address the inad inadequate dried product quality, which to improve the, the road right sea with innovative solution for available resources such as solar energy to ensure the low production cost coupled with the capacity to dry during short and reduce sunshine and even night time. So the development of this machine um, primarily begin with the characterization of seaweeds and what is the seaweeds, what are the specific requirements such as the, the moisture content, the desired moisture content to meet the global standards. So after that, um, the innovation bring into table, and this is the um, convection, hybrid convection solar dryer with the auxiliary heater powered by solar panel and um, through a solar thermal air collector as a main source of energy to drive the, the, drive the processed air to drying chambers. So this um, research covers the experimentation procedures wherein um, first is the preparation of the sample. The sample weight is 5.1 kilograms and it starts with cutting and cleaning of the seaweeds and after that um, washing and of fresh wa running water and then after um, seaweeds is soaked with uh, fresh water of about two hours and the the obtained moisture content of this is 93.70 percent and after the sample of the same mass were arranged into layer of three, which is to be subject to the solar dryer. And this dryer has a temperature controller to maintain the temperature inside the drying system. And to come up with the output of dried, and to come up with the output of uh, desired moisture content of 35 0.31%. And um, that experimentation runs with three types of temperature at 40 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, and 60 degrees Celsius. So now it's go, let's go for drying system performance. So the result show that the hybrid convection solar dryer for seaweeds with experimental capacity of 5.1 per 400 minutes with desired moisture content of 35.31%. Um, this may, the processor may able to produce dried seaweeds four times faster than the conventional drying method. Along with different drying temperature, 40, 50, 60, the results showed significant difference, which were as 60 degrees Celsius performed more efficient. This conforms the drying temperature had a great impact influence the removal of surface moisture of seaweeds as it, it, as it was attributed to highest reduction rate. And it conforms to the study of Yaha 2007. So the average temperature profile of solar collector, which is the main source of heater heating system, coupled with the, the, the solar energy coming from the uh, solar panel, and it has a recorded solar irradiance of 365 watts per m squared. Furthermore, the hydro hybrid convection solar dryer produced 
road ride seaweeds with optimum drying quality, which would result to to seaweeds product for better quality. So the drying system, um, actually, this experiment involved the presentation of Grisher curve to illustrate the relationship of moisture content and drying rate. And this suggests that the rate of movement of removal of, mo of moisture and diffusion and evaporation in a convection drying process were energy dependent and requires constant temperature regulations. So that sense, in that sense, um, this, the temperature regulation serves well. The drying temperature at 60 shows significant result compared to the other to, to the two to the two drying conditions, which is the 40 and 60. And this suggests that the, this result, um, the mass transfer was mainly driven by temperature during the drying operations. So as you can see in the figure five, the plot of experimental and predicted value um, shows, it described the model of Henderson and Pavis model, um, which is best fit as the result combination of the uh, moisture ratio under the convection solar dryer. So this, re this result showed a very high percentage of possibility that the model could predict the drying rate behavior at any given condition of drying temperature. So after the drying, we, need, um, we evaluated the, the dried product, which the dried product at 40 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius to, to identify which of the product output is the better appearance. So in terms of color, the, the better appearance observed is at the temperature 60. Additionally, the product was analyzed by the personnel of the PFAR um, and they gave the satisfactory rating of 8.5 based on the physical observation, 460, while 40 degrees Celsius is at 7%. 7 seven rating. So to come to, con to, to conclude this research, the study um, particularly is to address and to help the farmers to produce a high quality white dried seaweed, which is um, has a high value in the market. And the drying system suitable for drying seaweeds with an optimum drying quality, this is for the purpose of pro producing good quality. And that the drying result indicated the satisfactory performance where the optimum drying temperature was obtained at 60 degrees Celsius uh, with the drying with an optimum drying quality of 35.31 moisture content. This is remarkable and it has a remarkable lightness of color result result while with the 99.1 of coefficient of correlation, which is an up, um, valid, ito yung finit doon sa model na, na representation for Henderson and Pavis model. So all in all, the color of the side moisture provides the good quality of dried seaweeds with 8.5 satisfactory rate of, from B bar. So that's all my presentation. Thank you for the intention attentions. God bless. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rocaberte. So we have uh, questions on your presentation. So I'll just, uh, because there are questions with uh, uh, sim similarities, so I'll just uh, combine these. So from Ms. Zela Ubalde and also from our session chair, Dr. Los Visminda Bilutindos. So the question is, there are other studies about drying system devices to dry seaweeds. What makes your study different from those other studies? Or what is the innovation that was uh, introduced in the design of your dryer? Interesting question. Thank you for this interesting question, sir. Um, actually, um, my innovations um, quite different from other developed drying system because um, actually this concept, this concept with the hybrid, a mix of solar panel, 
source of energy and by use of convection convection system where where gumamit po ako ng um, solar thermal air collector to suck the air from the environment goes going to the to going to the drying chamber so um, this is quite different kasi actually po um from the field of seaweed farmer talagang kailangan pa nila ng great innovations to for them to select which is the which is viable which is where is viable and which is more efficient so i think my innovation would give a uh, satisfactory since um, i attained uh, a standard prescribed standard of the pns that the rate with the moisture content of 35.35 percent moisture content and as for the the bfar the result of my product um gives um an um give a satisfaction in terms of I know, um, desirable appearance for the quality of seaweeds. Okay, thank so, you very thank you. much. So we also have a question from our panelist, uh, Mr. Robert uh, Peña. Now, as we understood it, you are using solar panels to aid yes, the yes. drying process. Yes, Bob. So the question, from Mr. Peña is as follows. Does the improvement in quality justify the cost? Because there is an additional cost for the uh, solar panels. And how effective is the uh, uh, PV, the solar panel PV energy stored in the battery in providing power during inclement weather? So maybe for the first question, uh, okay. does the improvement in quality justify the cost? And did you get the cost uh, added to your drying process because you are using solar panels solar. and battery? And what are these costs? Okay, um, actually, um, the cost, the total cost of this innovation is about when you go back to my last percent, uh, last la, third last slide. It costs ninety nine thousand, so the cost of innovation is ninety nine thousand, and the purpose of the solar panel, kung hindi kung ano po, to widen the perspective, um, bali po siya po yung magbibigay ng supplemental heating, to on po sa akin. Um, thermal air collector which actually po yung thermal air collector ko nakakaatay po siya ng three hundred sixty five heat watts per square meter so parang um the re the irradiance coming from the sun um na parang enough na at nakaka-save pa po ako in 7 hours na drying so hindi po um bali sa in a day po ng drying um hindi ko po masyadong naaano yun na utilize yung charge ng aking solar ng aking en ng solar energy ay ng solar panel and Yun nga po, in terms of ano, in terms of cost, um, this is quite ano, parang um, on the beginning side, the ninety nine thousand is quite expensive. But this is for the purpose of experimentation, and it may be go further to um, um, more experimentation to come up with the better and viable cost that is attainable and could be attainable to the farmers and the end users. Okay, thank you for the answer. Did you get the, because what you mentioned as the cost is the total cost of your system, but did you compute for like the la, during the lifetime of your solar, solar panel and battery, how much will be the cost because of the addition of the solar PV on the battery? How much will be the addition in the cost of drying per kilogram? Because yes, yes. Uh, this is that. an off-grid system and as we know, uh, electricity or energy from off-grid solar PV is uh, expensive. Thank you for that, sir. Um, actually, the, cost, the total cost of this um, weight per drying is 62 pesos kilogram per, per, per batch. So um, actually, um, in my experimentation po, na, tap, na, na ang ginamit ko lang pong specific weight para lang po kasi ma-attain yung um, desire, ano parang 
naka mode of experimentation na thin thin layer dragging um yung capacity po na inachieve ko is 5.1 kilograms lang pero kung titingnan po at nung tiningnan din po ng ng kung titingnan din po natin ang pinaka carrying capacity ng ng isang tray ko po is with a ano, kaya niya pong i-carry yung 5.1 in a one tray. So, it's a cabinet tray kung makikita niyo po. Um, cabinet tray siya na tatlong layer. So, masasabi ko na, na yung cost na 62 would be enough. But, syempre, on the first stage po yan ang experimentation. So, in the long run with the big capacity, carry yung capacity, masasabi po natin na mas mas magiging mura ang per kilo na yung per kilo na cost ng drying. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Locaberte. Now, uh, there are uh, other questions by Mr. Jerry Halibas, but uh, we are running out of time, so maybe you can answer these questions through the uh, Q&A box. You just write the answer to uh, Mr. Halibas. Thank you. Paul. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank again, you very much, Paul, uh, and God bless. Mr. Rocaberte. So we will now go to our next presentation. We will uh, proceed to the presentation titled GIS based site suitability analysis for biomass energy plant in Bohols rice and coconut producer municipalities. This will be presented by Ms. Winneville Galang from the University of San Carlos. Winneville, please yes, sir. Good start morning. the presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Allow me to present to you my research on GIS-based site suitability analysis for biomass energy plant in Bohol's rice and coconut producer municipalities. Along with me are my research advisor, Dr. Ian Dominic Tabanyag and Dr. Michael Rotero. So the province of Bohol in Central Visayas is a main uh, producer of agricultural products in the region. So it is called the rice granary of Central Visayas after it was cited for surpassing other provinces in the region in terms of rice output. So according to Philippine Statistics Authority and the Department of Agriculture, uh, the rice production in the province raised to about 52.4% in 2016 uh, to 2017. So representing uh, the rice uh, production in Central Visayas region. Along with that, um, the province also had a higher contribution in terms of rice production in the region, an improvement of about 45% in 2016 and 2017 data also. So in addition, the province is also abundant in coconut plantation. So Bohol Island has around 4 